Okay, good morning. Uh, today we're going to start a new modality, which is computed tomography. And um, it has some uh, special characteristics that make it, I, I think, uh, the uh, imaging method of choice uh, for cardiovascular disease anyway. Um, <clears throat> and we'll see that as we go along. Uh, this is a CT scanner. It looks like every other scanner that we've seen thus far pretty well uh, in the sense that the geometry of the uh, scanner itself is a cylinder. Uh, the bore size of the cylinder is on the order of a meter, a little bit more. And then inside here is the hardware uh, that is uh, used to make the image. Uh, unlike uh, SPECT and PET, where the patient was the source of radiation, and so the patient was glowing when he imaged the patient. Um, with computer tomography, this is just a, a version of a standard X-ray imaging where you generate the X-rays at a source. You fire them through the patient, so it's a, basically an X-ray flashlight. Shine it through the patient and look at the shadow that is cast by the patient on the other side. Uh, of the patient. And, um, and we'll see in the geometry in a CT scanner, you take those pictures at many different angles. And then from those different angles, you can reconstruct a three-dimensional object. Uh, a couple of things are shown here. This tech is putting on uh, ECG leads. And so during this exam, you will uh, record the ECG of the patient. Not only will you record the ECG, you will use that signal to trigger the scanner so that you know when your images have been obtained with respect to uh, some time in the, in the heart cycle. Uh, this tech is about to connect a line uh, to the patient, although his arm's not exposed here, but he'll have a, a, um, a needle in, <coughs> excuse me, in the um, decubital vein here usually. And through that, uh, entry or through that line, uh, imaging contrast agent will be injected into the patient. And the dynamics of that contrast injection is quite important in cardiac CT or in, in angiography as well, cardiovascular CT. So you want to take your images when this contrast agent that's injected into the patient's bloodstream is still at a fairly high concentration because it, it the, the Contrast agent itself is the thing that's going to generate a lot of contrast, or a, it will cast a very dark shadow on the detector. The contrast agent will. So if the patient's vessels are full of this agent, you'll see a really nice angiogram uh, during that time. But that only lasts for, you know, on the order of 10 heartbeats, something like that. And it, there's a peak inside that 10 heartbeats that's fairly uh, high. So these are the type of images you obtain. Uh, these are two-dimensional samples through a three-dimensional object. Okay, so basically we've selected voxels from a three-dimensional box uh, to display. And this is in the sagittal orientation, or we're looking from the patient's left through to their right side. This is in the axial orientation, we're looking from the patient's feet up towards their head. And uh, so this is the patient's chest. The spine is here. The descending aorta is here. Left arm is over here, right arm. This is the right ventricle, left ventricle, obviously. And then here we've selected a plane that's essentially parallel to the floor. And, and it's called a coronal plane uh, where uh, you can see the aorta, etc. This is the diaphragm and the lung space. So you can see a remarkable difference in signal intensity here than say in the myocardium or to air. This brightness uh, is because of the contrast agent. If there was no contrast agent here, most of this signal would look fairly similar. But I, the thing that really separates CT uh, from the rest of cardiovascular imaging is the spatial resolution that is achievable. And uh, so you can image the actual geometry of you know, relatively small vessels that are on the 
surface of the heart. So these are the major coronary arteries. These are the ones that are going to kill you if you die from heart disease. And the question is, are they open? Are they closed? And on SPECT, ultrasound, PET, we were unable to answer that question with any of those uh, techniques. We had to go to x-ray, the x-ray angio lab or cath to, to look at that. With cardiac CT, that's not true. You can actually see the geometry of these vessels that are really important. And this all occurs in one heartbeat. So you make this picture, this full three-dimensional picture of this heart in about 150 milliseconds. All right, so it's a fraction of a heartbeat, a sixth of a heartbeat or something. So it, it's a huge leap in ability to visualize cardiovascular disease or coronary disease. Um, the fact that you can do this with a CT scanner now is, is uh, I think, game-changing for the whole field. And it, the question is, if you're a 56-year-old person and you're starting to have chest pain, why on earth would you not get one of these pictures? Right? There is absolutely no reason not to get one of these pictures because the radiation dose is quite small. No, it's not invasive. It's super, super low risk. So you may as well find out what's going on. That's from your perspective, from an individual's perspective, from the perspective of the insurer, of the government, of the whole village. Maybe we don't want to spend the money to look at your coronaries, right? Because the yield may not be that high, right? We, may, we might spend a lot of resources just looking at normal coronaries. But from your personal perspective, the calculus is different, right? So it's, it's, this is like right in the heart of what you would call uh, personalized medicine, right? It's like, one of the, it's like one of those decisions where you have a drug that can save the life of 1,000 individuals that have a rare disease, but the drug costs $500,000 a year. Okay, who pays for it? And so it's, it's a really interesting, although this cost is much, much below that, but it's the same ethical question, right? Rather than look at them in three dimensions spinning around, you can look at coronary vessels in a projection view. And so these, the reason the vessel looks so profoundly contrasted and you can see such a long length along the vessel here, is because a slab of the patient, say a one inch thick slab, is isolated from the three dimensional CT. And then through that slab, you project the maximum pixel along a ray. So you're looking at the slab and you draw rays through the slab and then the image that you create is where that ray goes through that volume, the slab, you just pick the maximum signal along that ray and project it up and you get pictures like this. And so now you can see the whole course of the vessel. For humans to read these things, it's, it's easier because you can see if I, if I have some region I'm looking at and I'm trying to decide is it normal, abnormal, I can compare it with what's around it and it just makes it easier. Um, so right coronary artery, here's the left main coming off here. This is the LAD going down the, the central front groove of the heart. This is the right coronary artery coming off of the right cusp of the aorta. So CT scans, not only in cardiovascular disease, but primarily in all other uh, branches of medicine, oncology, emergency medicine, musculoskeletal, everything. Uh, because of the increased quality of CT scans, the use of CT is, has gone up sort of exponentially, as you can see with this graph, right? And, and this only goes to 2010. But back here, CT was slow, high dose, had, had probably, you really wanted a CT scan to get one back in the mid 80s. Now it's, well, in 2005, it's relatively low dose and very fast, right? So when you take a patient into the CT, they can get their study done in about three minutes. Right, so, you, so they're in and out. If you want to see CT scan usage at its absolute peak, go to a major hospital in Beijing. 
where they will do about four times as many patients as they do here per time, per scanner. They just crank them out. It's incredible. So this heavy usage of CT uh, caught the eye of a few people who said, you know what, we're doing 100 million CT scans over a you know, three-year period or something. That's a third of the population. Isn't that a source of background radiation at that point? Is it, so when you're looking at a population that large, you can say, well, maybe that total radiation burden to the entire population is not insignificant anymore. To an individual, you know, it's, it's, if you get a CT scan and it's three millisieverts, that's the same as the background radiation. It increases your personal risk a small amount, right? It's not a big deal. If you have 10 million people you do that to, a few people out of the 10 million will, will come out and will have events associated with that because there's just so many people, right? And so the odds are, you know, that in the 10 million you'll get somebody. So there are a number of papers written in the mid-aughts, like 2005 or 2008 or something like that, where they looked at background radiation from CT or just CT radiation to the population from CT was insignificant. They predicted based on this radiation there would be I think 2,000 cancers a year or, or was it 200 something like that which was a prediction based on a model where you looked at high dose radiation and its carcinogenic effect and those data are from uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki where people were irradiated during the the drop of those bombs, the hydrogen bombs, or they, the atomic bombs, or they weren't hydrogen bombs. But they looked at, at the radiation dose in circles away from the epicenter of that explosion. And most of the data for cancer and things like that come from that. And then you project that data back down to zero, and you, and you assume that the, the detrimental effect you know, continues down linearly which is absurd, right? In a biological model, that's, that's just absurd. It's like saying that, you know, you can use data for people who run 50 miles, you know, a day, what it does to them, project that back down to somebody who runs, you know, three miles a day. That's just not true, right? So anyway, they, it's a interesting topic. Uh, if somebody wanted to, uh, review some of those papers, uh, I'd be welcome to listen to them. Uh, they, they became really famous, these papers, because they got in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and everything else, and they changed CT, actually. This is the good thing about it. There was a bit of hysteria about radiation, and then it forced companies and engineers and everybody just to not be lazy. Just stop being lazy making images with higher radiation, learn how to make images with lower radiation. And the dose from CT scans over the course of that went down by about a factor of 10. So they were being lazy, right, was the, the point, right? Is, so anyway. Uh, here's the geometry again. We have a source of x-rays up here. Uh, we, we probably will not go into the how those are generated, but the x-rays come out of the uh, x-ray tube, that's a lamp basically, and uh, they are detected on the opposite side of the patient and usually there are multiple detectors in Z. So we'll, we'll take a look at the geometry, but nowadays you, you can have up to 320 of these detectors this way. In the theta direction, the orthogonal direction, you usually have about a thousand detectors this way. So you have about 1,000 by a 256, 1,000 by 320, something like that array of detectors behind the patient. So the patient is casting a shadow on that detector. And you just take a picture of the shadow and then move the angle, take another picture of the shadow. Okay, and that can be done very rapidly. Here's a, a diagram of that detector in, in, uh, in a cartoon. Uh, again, about 256 this way in a modern scanner. The Siemens, I think they put 128 
uh, this direction. Toshiba does 320, GE does 256. Uh, and then this direction, there's 1,000. So this is not to scale. Okay. This angle here is called the cone angle. And the reason it, this is essentially like, it's called cone beam CT. And that is the, the geometry of the flux of x-rays coming out is like, is like a cone. And it makes the reconstruction slightly more difficult. The fact that the detectors out here are seeing x-rays from a different angle in, you know, in the basically head to foot direction, the SI direction, than the detectors down here. These slices are not sets of parallel slices through the patient during raw data acquisition. They're actually angled. And so that's going to com complicate the reconstruction to a certain extent. So when you uh, look at the geometry of the situation, here's the bore of the scanner, the, basically the center, or the isocenter where of the rotation of the gantry. This, is, this detector and the x-ray tube are, are on a mechanical gantry, which rotates around. I think I have a picture of that. Uh, and we have the source to distance and source to center. And as you can see from the the geometry or the optics of the situation here, if I have an object right here, say, say the patient is lying on their back and this is their chest, and I have an object sitting on their chest here, the geometry of this is when I shine the light through that object and it casts a shadow, it will be magnified. Right? So there is a, a magnification factor that's going on that's dependent on your position in the object. And then if there's something here in the patient's spine, so this is their chest, this is their spine. In this view, it will be magnified less. Right? So there is a depth-dependent magnification going on uh, in this view. And it's, it's pretty simple to see that just from the, the geometry like this. And so here's a cartoon of how the pictures are taken as we rotate. Both the source and the detector rotate together. The whole thing is very rigid on a, on a mechanical gantry and the entire thing rotates around. In the early days, uh, the electronics for generation of the x-rays and also for extraction of the data. So as you can imagine here, you get, you, you generate a flash of light when an x-ray is detected and then that's turned into a voltage. And that voltage you read out, you know, with a preamp, etc. All of those signals have to get out of here back to your computer. And so in the old days, there was a large ribbon cable over which those signals traveled during the acquisition. But if you have a cable, you can rotate this thing you know, so far, but eventually you have to rotate it back <laughs> because the cable's attached, right? So they had a very nice way of like the cable just sort of moving and attaching. It would go back and forth like this. And, um, and so it kind of limited the speed at which you could do anything because obviously you had to stop the darn thing and then rotate it backwards, etc. Then Siemens, Siemens, they've all shared discoveries in this field, but Siemens were the first to engineer uh, electrical brushes. So on multiple channels, they had contacts basically, and the, the brushes were in contact electrically and it was called a slip ring technology so that you could essentially rotate the gantry and just keep it rotating and the signals came over this slip ring. And that absolutely revolutionized, that was revolution number six or something in the whole cascade of how CT was developed, but, but that was huge because now you could rotate the gantry just constantly. Not only that, if you're only going one direction, you could speed it up. So it's like, yeah, let's put a little, a little more force and, and go faster and faster and faster until finally these gantries were really humming, right? And so now I've got this gantry rotating really fast. You can just take a patient, just whoop, run them right through and get a spiral through the patient. That was called helical CT. And that is one of the heels in this curve here, right, is when helical CT came on board. All of a sudden you could do four times as many patients, right, as you could before. 
and and so that there was a large growth there and then they started putting multiple detectors in Z and the and the growth just continued because at one time the CT scanner would only have one of these rows in the Z direction there would be one set of detectors right now there's 256 okay there's an interesting um, modulation of the fluence of the x-rays that are generated to cast the shadow. So here's our uh, x-ray tube up here. It's like a flashlight. Shines the x-rays out here. If, if you have uniform um, fluence as a function of theta, so the, the brightness of the light along here is exactly the same as the brightness of the light along here as it comes out of the tube, by the time it goes through the patient, it will have dimmed a lot right here because a lot of that uh, x-ray uh, energy will be absorbed by the patient. Whereas over here, when it just goes through a small amount of patient, you'll have a very bright signal, right? So they instituted or they invented what's called a bow tie filter where you, you change the fluence as a function of theta so that you get more x-rays here, fewer x-rays over here. And then when you get to the detector, the dynamic range of the signal will be compressed. So as long as you know what the fluence is at this point, you can normalize it such that when you get your shadow, you know the fraction of x-rays that were absorbed. And my, principally, I think this is back in the day when, you start, when CT was starting and you had to digitally sample all this stuff, you had very limited dynamic range in those those detectors, you know, maybe eight bits or eleven bits or whatever, you know, and so they had to compress the dynamic range, I think, of the signal, and so they did this bow tie filter to that. The advantage also is you don't hit the patient with as many X-rays. Okay, so the the total dose goes down to get a kind of a dynamic range of contrast. Any any question about that? One question would be, well, what do you make this thing out of, right? Out of the bow, the bow tie filter, if you want to absorb x-rays, what, what would you absorb them with? So that when it, it's coming out here, you have this nice uh, change in fluence, you know, along, along theta. This thing's usually made of metal, because metal really absorbs a lot of x-rays, and you don't have to make it very thick to absorb x-rays. And your choice of metal will actually change the look, the color of the beam, right? So as a visual analogy, as the x-rays get bluer or higher energy, right, or redder, this is, this is totally false. They don't have color like that because that's just, you, your eyes don't detect them. But as they go to lower energy, you can visualize them as going redder, right? Um, you have a whole poly-energetic spectrum of x-rays coming out of your tube. And you can change that spectrum of energy by putting them through a metal that, say, selectively absorbs the lower energy ones. Right? And so the things that come out of the metal are, are just the high energy ones left. So <clears throat> you change not only the total number of photons, but also their energy spectrum that are coming out of this bow tie filter. And so you can make it out of copper, aluminum, tin, all different metals to change the spectrum of the x-rays. Oh, here's, and here's an example of some bow tie filters that are in the x-ray tube. Um, and so if you have a really small object and you need a, a fairly narrow beam, you can use this filter. Here's one for a large object and medium, and, and these, can, these metals can be made of different things. So you, you shift them to go in front of the, the beam as you need them. The other reason to, if you're imaging a, a small field of view inside a large field of view, um, it's probably easier to eliminate the signal from, from the stuff on the outside that you don't want to reconstruct, but that's, a, that's an advanced problem. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Okay, so here's, here's the whole geometry 
with the patient, the detector array. Uh, this is you know, a circular detector array. They're, they're usually not perfect circular things. Um, but our source is up here. A beam goes through the patient. And then a certain amount of the x-ray uh, energy is absorbed by the patient. And then the patient casts a shadow. And that number of x-rays is detected here. And so this is a plot as a function of position along the detector. So this is just detector number along here. It could be theta, you know, however you want to parameterize it, but detector number. And this is the number of x-rays detected by the detector at that position. So over here, we have x-rays come through. They don't even hit the patient, and they hit the detector. And so you get a very large number of x-rays hitting the detector because nothing attenuated it except the air. So the beam goes straight through. Here, on the other hand, right in the central part of the patient, there is the spine, and there's a lot of bone in the spine, and bone attenuates x-rays very well. Hence why you get a standard x-ray image when you break your arm or whatever, and they put it on there, you see all the bones really well, right? Because they attenuate x-rays really well. So in CT, you also get the same attenuation from the bone. And so down here, we might only have a few percent of the x-rays left. So if a 1,000 x-rays enter the patient here, by the time we get out, we may only have 50 of them left. And so you record that on that detector. Okay. We make this profile at a whole set of angles. And so now we have a new function a new one-dimensional function that is parameterized by the angle at which the source uh, is tilted. Okay? So we just gather up all of these different profiles. Is there any, any questions about that? No. So at this point, I mean, CT historically has always been done in two dimensions when it's explained, right? But if you have a detector right here, this is exactly like a chest x-ray, what I'm showing you here. It's a chest x-ray where the source is really close to the patient, and the detector is quite narrow in the head to foot direction. So how many people have had a chest x-ray? Three, only three you got chest x-rays. Interesting. You know, a healthy group. Um, so. When you stand in front of a chest x-ray, remember you stand against that detector behind you. It's a square about this big. Nowadays, you're all of the age where the inside that thing that's this big is it a digital camera, a digital detector. You know, it's like 2K by 4K or something. And you, you, you stand far away from the source. Everybody leaves the room and they go poof. And that, and a, pile of x-rays shoot out of the source, go through you and hit the detector behind you. And then what you've got at the end of that is just a picture of essentially what are the bones and then some bit of soft tissue stuff. If you have pneumonia, for example, you'll see that. Um, so that whole thing is about this tall. This is exactly that process. It's just the detector is kind of short. It's about this tall. Right? And so you go, poof, and you, and you take that picture of, of that much of the patient. But then you can actually, if you could do CT right there, if you took 800 chest x-rays and you rotated the patient a slight angle each time you took a chest x-ray. You just put them on a, on a spinny thing and then spin the patient and just keep taking chest x-rays. Bang, 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 right? If that patient could stay in exactly the same pose during the spin, then you would get the data you need for, for one of these. Right? So to compensate for the fact that the detector is short in the Z direction, or the superior to inferior head to foot direction, you can do what's called a spiral scan or a helical scan. And if you want a CT scan for the whole body of the patient, you essentially start 
the detector rotating in a constant direction, and then you push the patient through that. What's going on back there? Is that you okay? You all right? Oh, it's up top. Oh, okay. Well, that, I saw it coming from here, or heard it coming from here. Are you wearing a mic? I am not. No, it's not. It's not. I don't think we have a mic on. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> There's a good thing. Hopefully, they don't say anything, you know, embarrassing. embarrassing. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just keep going. We'll talk through it. Um, so, and that, that's called helical scanning when you continuously move the patient and you're not only taking angular views, but you're also taking different views in Z or in SI or the, the head to foot direction. Okay. Could you go to the front office and ask them what the heck's going on? Thanks. Um, the other way of doing it to cover more uh, linear dimension in the head to foot direction you can do one image with a specific dimension in Z, and then you, you do your full-on rotation around the patient, and then pause, move the patient an entire detector length, and then do another one. All right, and that's called step and shoot. For cardiac, this method of acquisition is probably preferable. If we need m multiple steps to go through the heart, most scanners now, you, you take one slab, you know, and you do a full 360 degrees around that location, and you use the next heartbeat to move the patient, and then you do another 360 degrees. And you walk through the heart that way, okay? You walk, walk along. Although this is still done by some scanners. So if you look at the history of of just the speed at which CT data is obtained and the sort of size of images that we can achieve over the course of, of historical CT time. Um, you can see that the samples per second or the vo voxels per second uh, really are going up kind of with Moore's law, right? In that it's, it's tracking with so the digital technology that can take up all of the, the information and process it. Uh, so in the early days, the first CT scans that were done looked like this. Uh, and you could get two of these images every 20 minutes, right? Hey, how are you doing? Oh, OK, thanks. I'm going to do a pause here. Well, it sounded like it must have been coming somewhere else because we heard it like a Bing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's. Can you hear your voice right now? It's. Was it? Me? It wasn't me coming through that thing, right? No, it sounded like someone had like a hotel and they like yeah. walked out of the room. Oh. Yeah. So it's all better now. Seems so. Okay. Is your voice projecting? Is it? No, I'm not using a mic. It it was like an external source. Okay. Of. No you guys thought it was the speaker. And it was the speaker. It was coming out of those speakers. Something was affecting Yeah. I don't know. All right, thanks. Okay. So an 80 by 80 image every 20 minutes. Now we're getting 320, 512 by 512 images every 280 milliseconds at full, full on 360 degree uh, sampling, right? So it's, it's a remarkable uh, increase in information. So this is the gantry, the mechanics and the, and the engineering of this thing. Uh, the detector and the x-ray source are in here. It, it causes a bit of noise and, and sometimes some anxiety in the patient as this thing spins up because it, it's hard to make something spinning that fast, uh, essentially super quiet. One of the challenges for the engineers is to make this thing really quiet. Um, the other challenge is that the whole 
all of this hardware is moving um, through 360 degrees in about a quarter second. And so at a fifth of a second, at 200 milliseconds, the, basically the g-forces on, on stuff like this x-ray tube here are 80 g's. Right? So it's an it's a engineering challenge to make everything really um, stable and, and, and tolerant to that kind of thing. Here is the detector itself. On top of the detector is an anti-scatter grid. And this is the x-ray tube, and the power for the x-ray tube is here. Right? The voltage uh, is generated here. Uh, so the x-rays come out through the patient who's sitting here and hit this detector. Um, anything else? This is what it looks like when it's installed. Um, you know, so the x-ray tube, detectors down here, power. And then you can, there's some uh, videos online on YouTube. If you just type um, CT scanner rotating gantry in YouTube, there's, there's like a half a dozen of where engineers have taken the skins off of these things and then started them up. And you can watch this thing spin, right, as how fast it goes. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, is there something else we want we should look at here? So you can, you can cone down the x-rays in Z if you don't need the full uh, dimension in Z. And as you go down to a narrower dimension, the reconstruction becomes easier and probably the spatial resolution and image quality gets better inside that volume as you get towards the middle, right? As opposed to using data that's way outside here. Um, and I think that's about it. So on top of the detector array, so these little um, devices here are the x-ray detection core device and, and they cause a flash of light when an x-ray hits uh, the detector surface and then voltage uh, is generated by trans, uh, a photodiode making a, a voltage from the light. And clipped on top of this is an anti-scatter grid. And this is exactly the same principle as See, uh, SPECT, when we looked at anti-scatter for SPECT, you basically want to see straight down from source through the patient. You don't want to get a lot of uh, x-rays that are coming in at oblique angles due to scatter. Okay. So if an x-ray comes from the source, interacts with the patient, and then comes at a crazy angle across here, that's just going to cause background signal that isn't giving you a, a coherent shadow. It's just giving you a sort of a a DC offset brightness that is roughly proportional to the geometry of the object above you and how it scatters. That's not really what you want to image. What you really want to image is just the direct uh, attenuation of x-rays as you go on a direct line through the patient. So this is the anti-scatter grid. This direction is Z on this detector. Uh, so there's 256 in this direction, right? And each one of these units is clicked in to the, the two-dimensional detector. Well, let's take a look at it. So what we're looking at is one of them across this way, right? And then they come in modules and they just snap in across here. So 256 this way, about 1,000 this way. And this is Z, 256 this way. Um, oh, let's see if this displays, because this, this has some really good graphics of, of the detector itself. Hey. So there's an opening up. This is Z. All right, this is the anti-scatter grid. And there are those uh, detector um, units here. And each one of these units the, the little uh, square there is a single pixel or single dexel, a detector element, right? And so it's spatially localized if you get a, a flash in that detector element uh, and that's uh, encoded as to where it goes. 
It's 160 centimeter coverage is, is what this is um, uh, specced at, but that's 160 centimeters at the center of the CT scanner, not at the detector. This is much more than 160 centimeters, but when you project back to the center, it gives you uh, something 160 centimeters in length. Okay. Uh, so here's a one detector element with the electronics in it uh, that gets snapped in. The other interesting thing, I guess, about this detector is you can see they're kind of angled. The central one, two, three, four elements are flat, but then they they pitch up in Z. So it so you're trying to make a bowl now of, of detection to get the geometry uh, the most efficient and. Let's see what else we have. And focally aligned detectors, da, 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 da. and that's how it snaps into the, the whole unit. So, you know, they've been working on these things for 40 years or something now. So they're they're pretty advanced uh, pieces of technology, and the things you have to worry about are the efficiency. You know, do, do x-rays just pass right on through this detector? Uh, similar the, as we saw in SPECT. Uh, and the spatial resolution of, de of determining where that x-ray was when it, when it uh, flashes on the detector. So as you can imagine, the more little dexels you put in here, the higher the resolution for determining the angle of that x-ray coming in. And so the higher the resolution of your image. This is a, a picture that I took on our scanner, and uh, it's a picture of air, right? So you basically just take, don't put anything in the scanner, scan, and then read out what's on those detectors, right? And so this is what was read out for, each, for that detector array uh, with nothing in the scanner. So there's some really interesting stuff going on here, right? It's not a uniform field of view, even though the air is, one could consider a uniform sample, right? What's going on here is a, a spatially varying number of photons detected uh, due to engineering stuff, right? It's hard to make a really uniform uh, beam of x-rays. So the brightness here is obviously uh, slightly different than the brightness over here, and that would be due to the, the beam coming out of the x-ray tube. Uh, as it exits the x-ray tube, it just has a different angular dependence on fluence, and part of that is where you're looking with respect to the, the target itself that made the x-rays. It's called a heel effect. We won't go into the details. But then the other thing you can see is there's obviously a patchwork of sensitivities here. And that it sort of looks like when you're flying over, you know, Kansas or something, you see farms. And, you know, this farm here, this patchwork, obviously has a slightly different gain for all of the detectors. Remember, there's probably, uh, there's 256 in this direction. One, two, Right, so it's like 16 along here. Um, and so this 8 by 4 probably have a different preamp, right? And so there's, there's some kind of regional uh, sensitivity change there due to the, the preamp and that. So, and then there's this, a larger region over here, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're doing CT, the moral of the story, when I'm show, what, the reason I'm showing you this is what you really want to detect is the fractional change in x-ray absorption for that detector versus what you would see in air, right? So this type of data is taken regularly, right, to normalize the images or the raw data that you're going to take in a patient. Right, because you have to normalize it to the sensitivity of the detector. And then this is the anti-scatter grid, and for this geometry, 
remember this is uh, z in this way, you need lateral uh, elimination of, of lateral uh, uh, scatter, so things that are at angle this way, plus this direction. So it's an interesting 2D array. I think it's a movie, yeah. And so as you, there's objects underneath this array, and you can see they disappear at certain lateral views, right? And uh, so these are the objects you're, you're looking at. And so that's the anti-scatter grid that's on top of the detector array. Here is an object in a CT scanner. Uh, it, it's nothing you would recognize because it's a, a bottle. We, we actually printed an object that has this sinusoidal shape. This is the cap on the bottle. Inside the bottle is contrast agent. Okay? So that's why this stuff is so bright. Uh, the shape is something that we just printed on a 3D printer. And then these objects here are pacing leads, right? And so they're, they're wires, electrical wires, and they absorb a lot of x-rays, so they show up as bright signals in the, in the picture, okay? And the reason I'm showing you this is because what we're going to look at next is what the raw data looked like to create that CT image. So this is a sequence of readouts on the detector array for that object. Right? And so it's just shadows at different angles. Uh, and you can see shadows from the table, the patient table itself, which is mostly transparent, but not 100% transparent to x-rays. And then the details of the two pacing leads here, and then the contrast agent in the hourglass uh, bottle itself. This, there's a, some interesting phenomenon that occur in these views. Specifically, if you look at that. So, see this thing here? This is obviously, if you look at the angle, that's probably the, some part of the table. Right? So we're looking edge on at the table at this point. So the source is down at 90 degrees, sort of shooting parallel to the floor. And so this is the the table right here. And then as it passes, as that passes through the object, you, it almost looks like you get some kind of diffraction effect here, right? So for those advanced students, if you want to figure out why does it distort, see what it does? It like pulls that off to the edge there. And right here. It's kind of a cool distortion, right? Whether it is a distortion or not, I don't know. But. So each one of these views is just a map of the, uh, essentially the absolute intensity or, or number of photons that hit the detector. Okay, so those objects that absorb a lot of x-rays cast a shadow. That's it, okay. So the intensity at any detector, D, is proportional to the fluence of photons that come out of the x-ray source, our, our basic our x-ray tube, that are headed directly towards our detector. Remember, there was this spatial dependence on fluence. So who's ever coming towards the detector? That's the, the um, essentially the in intensity out of the tube. The intensity is diminished by absorption of x-rays. And we're going to do a line integral through the object. And uh, the object is represented here, this function mu. We're going to do a line integral from 0 to, to the detector itself along ds, just a straight line through. And what we add up, it turns out, is the decay using this mono-exponential decay of the x-rays as a function along that line, right? So essentially you just go through and as you pass through voxels, you count the fraction or the amount of, of attenuation of x-rays that occurred in that voxel and you just add those up as you go through 
or in a continuous model, you integrate through the object. You can, uh, let me see if I, I might have a slide. Okay, let's go to this slide, because I think to understand it, we should, we should look at this. If I, suppose this is a, an object that does attenuate x-rays. And so that could be water, muscle, bone, metal. Air, on the other hand, doesn't attenuate x-rays much. If I shoot 1,000 x-rays and hit this object, say 20% of them get absorbed due to the nature of the object. It's sort of electron cloud density. And then 800 emerge from there. And then I have exactly the similar object right here. So 800 photons hit that. What happens is 20% of those 800 photons get absorbed, so I'm down to 640. If I do it again, 20% of the 640 get absorbed, I go down to 520, right? So it's a fractional change. This is a, a simple first order, you know, differential equation that has a, a mono exponential as a solution. As you start with the number of x-rays going through, as I pass through a distance x, of this stuff, right? I reduce my number of x-rays uh, uh, exponentially with this uh, linear attenuation coefficient. So as a function of space, I, I, this is my simple mono-exponential decay of x-rays that are, are getting absorbed, or are getting through, I'm sorry, uh, emerging from the other side. So this attenuation coefficient, this linear attenuation coefficient, is the thing that characterizes the interaction of the x-rays with the material. So if I have water, it will have a specific linear attenuation coefficient. You know, I need so many centimeters of water to reduce the x-rays by 50%, say. Versus bone, I need far less uh, distance to attenuate the x-rays by 50%. It has a higher attenuation coefficient. And so that attenuation coefficient is in fact what we're going to make a picture of. So in the end, when we display a, an image on the screen, that image will be linearly proportional to the value of the linear attenuation coefficient at each point in my picture. So the brightness of the picture will be proportional to that. Right. So let's go back to our example here where this is the shadow to get to a point where I have brightness proportional to linear attenuation coefficient. What we do is we take the incident intensity of photons, or I naught, and divide it, or we take the, the number of photons at the detector and divide it or normalize it to the incident number. So this, this number, the number of photons detected versus those that were shot out of my source, this number is always going to be less than one. Right? We don't stimulate x-ray emission from the patient. That is a form of, of, of you know, of energy that you can achieve, but not in x-rays in people, <laughs> not at that energy level. And MR will find that when you, when you put RF in, you can bring RF out of the patient. But anyway, for x-rays, this is always going to be less than one. Right? So we take the I0 divided in here, we take the log of this, the negative of the log, because this is going to be less than one, so we get a positive number. And that positive number is proportional to the integration of the linear attenuation coefficient through the patient, right, along that ray, along the line between the source and our detector. And so that's this data, it's often called the logged data, right, or a projection now shows bright signal where you have a lot of attenuation. Remember in here, the raw data, it was fewer photons, so you got a dark thing. 
after you take I naught, divide it here, take the negative log to get this integral, basically it becomes a positive signal, you get a bright signal. Sorry, it's a different object, but this is a person. So here, brightness corresponds to where we have a lot of x-ray attenuation. And you can kind of recognize what's going on here, right? The, we're, we're looking at different views of the patient as we're rotating our source and our detector. And here's the heart, right? Here, this is the diaphragm. You can see the spine coming through here. And at certain angles, you get a lot of attenuation, right? So at this angle, we, we have a very high positive value. That means this value is very low, right? So this means a, this integral is very large at this point, so there's a lot of attenuation. And the reason it's large is it's going through the center of the heart, where the contrast agent is, and it's going through the spine, so a lot of the x-rays are attenuated. If you get to a point where you get down into the tens of photons, like, you know, maybe 100 photons or 10 photons, of, you know, detected here, you're in a very low amplitude region and, it, and things get really noisy uh, at that point. You don't really want to work down there if you can help it, but if you do super low dose imaging, you have to work down there, right? Oh, my bad. So there you go. That's what the raw data looks like to make the pictures. Do you remember we, we had this spinning raw data for SPECT? We did, we did exactly the same plot for SPECT, right? And this data looks a, a lot better. <laughs> it is just much higher resolution. You see these vessels in the lungs. They're like a bunch of chest x-rays in this patient, essentially. This is exactly what they are. That same data that we just looked at, when you reconstruct it, looks like this. Okay? And so here's the chamber of the heart, all those vessels you were seeing in the lungs here, the spine, the descending aorta, etc. And so you get ridiculously good resolution. If we, you know, we can go up and down through this data, and let's let's take a look just for grins at say the uh, right coronary artery in this patient. So the coronary artery on the right side emanates from the root of the aorta right here. It's a small one. It's probably only about three millimeters or two in diameter across here. And you can track its course. Keep, so this is like follow the white dot game, right? You follow this dot and we're going we're gonna to track the course of that artery to there and then we'll track it down. So here it is here, I'll keep going down there, it's split, so it branched into two vessels right here and here, and keep going, and now it's at the right around the entering the posterior wall of the heart, this is again the right coronary artery here, and it goes around the back, there it is on the back wall of the heart, and then it squiggles its way down the posterior wall. This doesn't seem like a very efficient way to look at that data, but this is the way clinicians read it. They look at these raw axial views, and they have a mouse in their hand, and they just run up and down that vessel like this, and they look for areas where it disappears or it gets dark. And then if it disappears, if that circle disappears, then they basically have a problem on their hand. There's, there's an interesting thing right here. It's not disappearing, but what's happening right there? Can you guys see that pretty well? That little dot right there? That's like sort of a fraction of a millimeter of a chunk of calcium in that vessel. And it turns out that calcium is a harbinger of the formation of plaques in your coronary arteries. And you get calcium in your aorta, you get calcium on your um, as we saw on the leaflets of your valves, etc. And so it's a, it's a good indication that this person is able to generate lesions in their coronaries. Uh, it's not surprising, it looks like this person is 60-something, and so it's not unusual at that age to have calcium in your vessels. In fact, it's half the people do. 
And you can see on a major vessel here, we come out the left main and it branches here into the LAD is going to wind around there and there. All of that stuff there is calcium okay. as we go down. And then there's a nasty bit of stuff here. And so the question is, is there an open vessel here? If I go back and forth through there and ask you the question, do you think that's open? Is blood, does it have a free flowing ability through here? Right? It's, it's not a trivial question. It's a hard one to answer. And so, you know, that's why you try and make better and better pictures. Right? If you could make a higher resolution picture, you might be able to see more detail in here to answer that question definitively. But right now, we're sort of on the edge of the resolution that, that we can use. Right? So if there is a problem with CT, it's the fact that these bright calcium bits seem to get in the way of us determining whether or not there's a, an open vessel at that location. If you wanted to be, you know, a, an extraordinary, or you want to make an extraordinary contribution to cardiovascular research, solve this problem, right? Come up with a method such that when I take my image, I can remove the calcium from the image and just see the contrast die. If you do that, world's your oyster. You can start your own company with the with the royalties from that patent, right? So. Basically, the reason the vessel is bright, the reason this blood in the aorta is bright is because there's contrast in there. We would like to be able to see that contrast all the way through this, the course of that vessel. right? This calcium that's growing in there is getting in the way. So right here, I can't tell you. Is it open or is it calcium? Right? So it doesn't seem too hard, right? Just how would we get rid of the calcium signal? Well, there should be a way to do that. Okay, well, we kind of looked at that. Okay, this is a really cool, cool scanner. Um, so, suppose we can't rotate the thing any faster because we're already at 80 Gs and, and the engineering department says, no, we're, we're done. Do not rotate this thing. <laughs> you know, faster at 100 milliseconds or something, because we're going up non-linearly, like in terms of forces, right? Um, so the way Siemens dealt with this problem is, it's really cool, is they said, well, we've got space in the gantry. If you take this and this out, here's a normal CT scanner. I've got a beam like this, and I'm just gonna rotate that around. Said, you know, I think we've got more space in here. Let's put a detector here and another source right here. So now I've got two scanners, essentially, running simultaneously. And so what they did was, instead of making their detectors deeper in Z, say, instead of going to 256 parallel scanners in Z from head to foot, they stayed at 128, and they put two scanners in the, in the gantry. So they get twice as much data in the theta direction, right? So they claim, at this point, they can make a picture, a 2D picture, at, in 66 milliseconds. Right? Well, that's pretty cool. Right? So, um, and if you wanted, you could, say, set this uh, X-ray tube such that the maximum energy of the X-rays coming out of that X-ray tube up here were 140 keV, which is you know a high energy X-ray. It's almost up to the gamma ray level, and then we'll set the X-rays coming out of here at say 80 keV. So we'll get an 80 keV picture this way, 140 this way, and they, that's equivalent in visual or in in optics or photography to say I'll take a picture with a blue filter on, and then I'll take a picture with a yellow filter on, and see what those two things do if they give me an orthogonal information. Um, well, look, let's, let's just see if, just for grins, we'll see if this works. Let's 
should still have that YouTube up here, yeah. So there you go, there's two detectors. There's one's a little smaller than the other, but and this is this is those engineers, you know, they take take the skins off and then start the thing up. And uh, and that's and that's sort of the rate at which the whole thing spins. Granted the video is not great quality. So now it's going backwards. See that's that's called the aliasing right there. That's, okay. Okie dokie. So the other uh, industrial or, or engineering feat that has been achieved uh, to make all of this happen is, is they've made x-ray tubes that are much brighter. Right? Back when you had a lot of time to collect your x-rays because everything was moving pretty slowly, you could leave your tube on and just integrate up the number of x-rays that were going through the, the patient. Now. In Siemens' case, they're telling you they're going to make an image in 66 milliseconds. That better be a pretty bright flash of x-rays to get enough right, uh, fluence through the patient. And so these are the sort of maximum power output in kilowatts of x-ray tubes over, over the years. And, and this new Vectron tube, and GE's got a new tube coming out. They all have high-power tubes, but it's like 120 kilowatt light bulb. 120 kilowatt light bulb that get, gives you x-rays. <laughs> you know, as an engineering thing, that's kind of cool, right? It's like, plug that sucker in. So, the, here's the EKG of, a, of, you know, a patient. And um, so, remember, we put the EKG pads on the patient. And then when they're lying there, you can watch the EKG come across the screen and try and time your acquisition such that you get either one whole heartbeat or you get a phase of the heart cycle that you're interested in. And there are two phases in the heart cycle if you want to image things that are, are in a stationary condition or stopped. There's basically two phases at which you can try and get that done. The first and longest interval at which the heart is kind of static where it's moving the least is called diastasis and that's when after the heart has finished ejecting blood and then refills between that point and the next heartbeat is usually the longest time that the heart will be in a relatively similar position so somewhere in that window you can you can grab your image if you want to image something that's not moving or not moving as much the other time is if you are really confident that you can image the heart right at the peak of contraction. So that is when the left ventricular volume is the smallest, it's called end systole, and it's ejected all of the blood. It will sit in that condition for 50 milliseconds or so, right? Maybe 50, 75 milliseconds. And the heart, the left ventricle and the two vent large ventricles of the heart are in their smallest geometry, right? They're crushed down and so it's all packed together so it's not a bad time to image it. That's what's being attempted here. So you have an EKG. Each one of these is the onset of a new heartbeat. Uh, you can see from this patient that they have a quite irregular heart rate, right? The, the basically temporal duration between one beat to the next is highly variable. So that's a problem. Um, you, for patients like this, you really want to get all of your business done in one heartbeat because each one of these heartbeats gives you a different pose or a different geometry. So you can't really combine them terribly well. So you pick a time about 300 milliseconds after the QRS and you say, I'm going to target my acquisition to be centered up on that time. And, you, and the scanner comes along and it, these little ticks on here tell you that it is detecting a trigger quite well at each QRS from that signal. So let's go and scan and it will hum along, detect a trigger and wait a specific duration and take the shot. 
And this is the lowest dose way to make a picture of the coronaries because you're just going to take data inside the window that's required for one image. And that's usually about 200 milliseconds or something like that. And so the x-rays are only on for a very short period of time. And you can get an image with a low dose. Uh, again, so here's uh, you know, the slices that uh, are obtained. It's a pretty amazing uh, resolution you know, for, for one shot uh, in that patient. We already did that. So the math of how you know, it works out to create a projection function, or this projection g as a function of detector position, uh, is shown on this slide. And uh, we'll probably go into, into more detail, but let's just introduce it uh, here. So here's the patient up, right, left, and we'll encode those as X and Y. If I have an X-ray source shooting a beam of X-rays, say, along this line, L, along here, um, the number of X-rays that are absorbed, as we discussed before, I naught X-rays, so the intensity of the X-rays emitted from the, the source hit the patient here, I naught, and then are attenuated as a function of position through the patient by this integral. And so it's the integral of the, basically an exponential decay with mu now changing as a function of position through the patient. Because as we pass through fat, mu will have a different value than muscle, than perhaps air in the bowel here, etc. And so all of these mu values are absorbing different amounts of x-rays. Our image, recall, will be a map of this function, of mu as a function of x and y and z. When we submit data for reconstruction, it will usually be in this form. And we've taken the detected signal, we've normalized it, uh, taken the negative log, so we get this positive function it's a function of detector position, which is encoded as L. And it's a function of angle of view through the patient, which is encoded as theta. And so we're going to have a two-dimensional ray, L and theta, of essentially positive numbers. Right? Unlike magnetic resonance or whatever, we cannot get a negative number. This function is going to, this thing is going to be positive everywhere, right? Um, that's what it looks like, as we saw before. And our CT reconstruction process is going to take this function, GL theta, which is just a two-dimensional function, and through some inversion or some process that we're going to figure out, we're going to make mu x y, because that's that's what uh, generated uh, this function, right? And that that's going to be CT image reconstruction. Is everybody clear how we're going to do that, or just the outline of that? So in just the next couple minutes, we'll we'll look at how we're going to encode the final picture. Once we get a, an image of mu as a function of x and y, another normalization is done in CT. And I think it's, um, it's essentially, CT has a set of normalizations at, at many steps. And this one is to make all of the relative attenuation, or the, the attenuation map relative to water and air. Okay, so we know what water is and we know what air is. And they are tested every day on the scanner. So they put a phantom in the scanner, whoop, and it's water, and they take a water scan, and then they take an air scan, and they calibrate the scanner that day. Right? And a CT number um, is essentially the difference between mu and that of water divided by water times 1,000. And these are called Hounsfield units. 
and uh, air in our scanner and any scanner is at a thousand minus a thousand. Water is obviously uh, at zero. And then you get these reasonably sized numbers. They're just kind of big integers. And uh, again, it could be, who knows? Maybe they, it was all about encoding stuff in, in into eight bits or something. But Soft tissue, the Hounsfield units are, you know, minus 100 to 60. Bone, 250 to 1,000. Remember, it's got high attenuation. Air has really low attenuation, minus 1,000, essentially zero attenuation. Metal, like wires and stuff like that, can be over 2,000. Calcium in the arteries can be very high, you know, anywhere from 150. This, this should be 150 to 1,500, et cetera. So if we look at a picture of a person, blood with contrast agent in it has 650 Hounsfield units. Uh, this metal lead right here is measured at 5,000. Fat in here is minus 120. Uh, bone 750 right on the, cor the cortical bone of the rib here. The muscle tissue itself has a Hounsfield unit of 120. This is a little piece of calcium in the aorta, 1300. Right? And so these uh, values really should be reproducible from one scanner to the next, right? because of all this normalization. So muscle in this patient, if they get scanned on five different scanners in the hospital, should be around 120. Right? This is going to change depending on the amount of contrast agent that's in the blood. So as the contrast agent diminishes and goes out through the kidneys and stuff, these, the Hounsfield units in the blood, will eventually return back to somewhere around 120, right? And then down in the, down towards the floor of the signal, so this is all bright stuff, down in the lung where you have dark stuff, it's about minus 800, it's not minus 1,000 like air, because there's some tissue in there. Um, and uh, the air itself, if you, if you go here, about well, minus a thousand. Okay. All right. And so on Thursday, we'll return to this issue of how we turn these projections uh, into images of linear attenuation coefficient. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's a great question. Uh, let's let me just shut this off.